Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Great, good. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. Over the last couple days, I've been humbled hearing about the work you are doing all around the country, all around the world, in your institutions, struggling day to day to deliver more value, to help more people, to make a bigger impact in your world. And I just want to start by thanking you for being here. You could have stayed home and been content with the status quo, but you're here today looking for ways to innovate, to move forward, and to, to deliver more value to the people that we serve. So before I start, thank you. Thank you all. Please give yourself a round of applause. So in talking about pharma collaborations, I always like to start at the end. What are we all doing here when it comes to health technology assessment? Why are we talking about data interoperability? Why do we care about partnering with pharma? What does the end look like? Well, for me, the end goal is bold. It's a learning healthcare system. A learning healthcare system that improves with every interaction. Where every piece of data that comes in generates an insight that is informing the next action. So that every time we see someone in our health system, everyone in the system benefits from it. And that's a big, bold vision. But it's technically feasible. There's a lot of political reasons why it's not happening, but technically it is feasible, and it is something that we all can work towards. So if we're truly going to have a learning healthcare system, we need pharma to be a strong partner, a strong collaborator. So I was very fortunate to have a career in pharma that developed alongside of data utilization. So I started in pharma in regulatory affairs. It's a great place to start in pharma, highly recommend it. You see the entire life cycle of a product. But in regulatory affairs, your main goal is to generate data to show a drug is safe and it works. Check that box. Well, that used to be enough to start selling a product. Then we saw the rise of HTA, of health technology assessment, all over the world. So pharma adapted and developed market access teams. So of course, I raised my hand and was among the first to help roll out market access in countries around the world. And there, you're developing data to show that a drug should be paid for. Usually, you're developing data to show that the drug should be paid more for than what they're currently paying. You're, you're generating a different set of information for a different set of decision makers. And then, of course, my last role in the life science industry was as chief digital officer for Bayer across the life sciences. And I can tell you, a digital transformation in a company of 120,000 people, it's not about technology. A digital transformation is not a tech topic. It's a people topic. And I explain it as saying, let's imagine you need a pacemaker, a piece of technology put into a living organism, put into your body. Who do you want to put that pacemaker into your heart? Do you want it to be the techie that designed it and knows about all the wires and the coding and the programming and the battery? Or do you want it to be your cardiac surgeon and your cardiologist who understand how to integrate technology into something living without with the least amount of disruption uh, to deliver a better outcome for the entire organism? And that's what we're doing with the digital transformation. We have our organizations, and they're living and breathing and functioning, and we're trying to update the technology so that they work better. And at its core, this is about learning. I, I always, when, when pharma CEOs call me, I always say that you don't really need a chief digital officer, you need a chief learning officer. Because if you train your population, if you train all of your people, if they understand the latest technology and they understand the challenges, you're not going to need to cajole them or push them to implement the latest, most innovative projects. They're going to they're see it. They're going to come up with it themselves. And I'll, I'll use the example. 
at, at Bayer, we were struggling for a while to get any work with Google passed. So you just heard from our colleague at Google. We were really struggling to get legal approval for anything with Google. So finally, I got all the country legal counsel, all of our head lawyers from our core countries, got them all together in a room with Google's lawyers. And after a couple days of learning, one of the key countries, actually, the, the colleague raised her hand and asked, so wait, you're saying you don't have the same IP address for your entire life? And we realized we had never taken the time to train our attorneys, to train our counsel. And so they were not approving any of the projects we wanted to do because of a fundamental lack of understanding of how it worked. And once we took the time to educate them and give them the information that they needed and the insights that they needed, all the projects got approved and went forward. And, and that was the digital transformation. And it is the same in marketing. You see digital marketing, you're seeing digital put in front of every position, digital marketing, digital supply chain, digital therapeutics. Well, we don't need duplicate roles across the organization. You don't need a digital duplicate of everything you're doing. And don't do that. What we need is to integrate digital into each of those roles. We need to build digital into how we operate. So I say all that to show that when you want to collaborate with pharma, there is a little bit of a secret to it. Uh, and any of you that have worked with pharma, let's see, can I see a show of hands of how many of you have worked with pharma for research or projects? OK, a good amount. So this will not come as a surprise to you. But the secret to working with pharma is process. Pharma cannot exist without process. Pharma lives by process. Of course, many of us do here, right? But it is the only way, process is the only way that pharma can take a molecule from a high throughput screener, take it through the labs, takes it through the toxicology studies in animals, to your first in man, your phase two, these massive phase three trials all around the world, to regulatory approval, to post-approval studies, to additional indications, and doing that in dozens of countries simultaneously. The only way that works is with process. And because process is the reason that pharma operates the way it does, we get a lot of good benefits. And one of them that usually I hear people complaining about, but I actually think is a positive, is that pharma processes are slow to change. They're slow to change, and that gives us the stability to take a molecule through 10 years of development to get it to your hospitals or to get it to your medicine cabinet. They're very slow to change, but they do change. So the question for us here is, what influences a change in pharma processes? What can all of us here today do to influence a change in pharma processes? So now I know you had some ABCs yesterday already. You get another set. You get the ABCs of influencing pharma processes. We're going to start with A, authorities. If you want to see how fast pharma can change their processes, take a look at health authorities. Health authorities in every country can show up for surprise inspections. They can arrest employees. They can tank your stock with one press release. They have a tremendous power. They are literally pharma's license to operate in every country where they exist. Now, we're very fortunate that in the US, our health authorities are leading dramatic change powerful change, and everyone in pharma is watching what is happening with pharma with the regulators right now. So I'm not going to go through all of these because there's no time, but a few of them really highlight what a special point in time we have today. We're really fortunate to have, a, to have health authorities who are pushing a real-world evidence framework. You know, the point of the real-world evidence framework, it's a short document, a PDF, you can Google it. It, it essentially says we want to use real-world evidence for regulatory decision-making. We want to be able to give you additional regulatory indications, regulatory expansions. We want to be able to do more with real-world data. 
I mean, the, the ONC proposed rule on data blocking, um, some of you probably saw Seema Verma tweet just this week talking about how committed this administration is to fighting data blocking and making sure health information from any EHR vendor is accessible via API. And that's tremendously powerful. You have the new Sentinel System five-year strategy. Sentinel System has been around a while, but they just released a new five-year strategy. Um, and in it, it explicitly says that Sentinel aims to be part of a learning healthcare system, and that it hopes to enable the use of real-world data in drug development. You have the informed studies. You have the NEST, the National Evaluation for Health System Technologies projects. This is where the FDA has designated uh, a group of studies. They just released another 12, where it's health disruptors, pharma companies. Um, you know, you've got Apple Watch and Pair Therapeutics, and you know your big guys like J and J and Medtronic, and and they're actively working with the FDA to see how do we how do we change the way we look at systems around devices and monitoring. And you can Google them and see which of those studies you can be a part of. And then you also have um, the duplicate study. And this is where the FDA is paying, they're paying, or you're paying, it's your tax dollars, um, you're paying to use real-world data to reproduce RCTs and to see what's the difference. What can you do about it? So if health authorities are the number one way to impact process change in pharma, how do you impact the health authority? Well, again, we're very fortunate in the US that this is easy. There are public calls for comments. You can go to the hearings. You can show up at the different meetings. You can be part of any of these pilot projects. You can join Nest. You can be part of Duplicate. Uh, you can be part of accelerating our regulatory change. And if you accelerate regulatory change, pharma adapts very quickly. So that's A, health authorities. B, barriers. Pharma's really good at navigating around barriers. Um, I'll use the example of health technology assessment. Uh, early in my career, when HTAs started gaining power around the world, uh, the pharma company that I was at decided to build a global market access team. So you had you know, basically, it used to be you go to regulatory, once it's approved, it gets handed off to marketing. Well, that didn't work anymore because you needed entirely new data, uh, especially when the trial wasn't comparing to something that payers were currently paying for in the market. So it was remarkable to see how a company of over 100,000 people could build an entirely new division and integrate it across the product life cycle to start collecting new and different data in clinical development and medical and, and go all the way through. Um, and we rolled this new department out in dozens of countries. It's now in every global, wherever we have a global presence, there's a market access team. And for many people, that was just surprising and fascinating to see that you could take a 150-year-old company and they could just build a whole new organization that goes across the entire company like that because of a change in barriers. Now, the barriers aren't all market access. You also have physical barriers, societal bar barriers. Um, you have guidelines that pharma is working to change to get their products included, changes in standard of care, institutional barriers. Um, but a lot of these barriers have something to do with the organizations that you all run. And you have tremendous power to influence the change in putting up new barriers or changing the old barriers. And when you do that, pharma will adapt accordingly, which brings us to C, cost. I know most of you are hoping C would be customers. Sorry. Um, cost is a powerful factor for changing process in pharma. And the shift now towards outcomes-based reimbursement is going to change the entire enterprise of what every pharma company looks like. So right now, pharma spends about $4 billion a year on marketing. Well, if you move to a world of outcomes-based reimbursement, you don't need to spend $4 billion a year on marketing, because the only thing that matters to your price is what? The outcomes. 
And so the work that we're doing here today on value-based care, on outcomes-based reimbursement, that's helping move the U.S. forward so that we can compete in similar ways. We've been doing outcomes-based contracting, value-based contracting in many countries for a long time in pharma. But in the U.S., the data was always too fragmented and it was too complicated and there's too many payers. Uh, our integration, our collaboration, together with groups like Health Catalyst, we can change the way data comes together. We can advance the outcomes capabilities with payers. So that's C, cost. D, data, my favorite. We are moving from a Polaroid world to a periscope world. A Polaroid snapshot to a live stream, 360 degree, with sound, controlled by the person, periscope world. And for so long in pharma, we were content, because we had no other option, to hire a CRO and have them enroll subjects and to get Polaroid snapshots of data throughout that trial. That was our only option. And now, pharma can work directly with patients. There are companies now that enable pharma to connect directly to an individual. That individual can sync all of their data sources from multiple hospitals, records, pharmacies, implantable devices. It auto-syncs in near real time. The programs clean it up, deduplicate it, make it usable. And then, with that person's consent, because they are the one now in control of their data, they can agree to give it to a big pharma company for a study. But because they are in control of the data, they also have some power. And so the relationship shifts between pharma and patients. Pharma now is able to treat these people in the study, these individuals, these patients, as partners. Share data, share updates, share publications. Invite them to participate in additional studies. You're really changing the game just because of how we're utilizing data. And many of you innovators here in the room, you're working with the groups or you are creating the capabilities that are making this shift possible. Our work here is moving us from a Polaroid world to a periscope world. And this, this is going to change pharma tremendously because Working directly with patients, it's faster, it's better, it's cheaper. So there's very little incentive to keep working the old way. So you're disrupting the whole ecosystem, which is E, ecosystem. Pharma operates globally and has a very good ecosystem. It can navigate countries, it can navigate political systems. We know how to get drugs reimbursed, we know how to get groups to show up at FDA ADCOM meetings or to have all their doctors send letters to the payer to, to make sure a drug gets paid for. Um, they operate really well in their state and country, in, in all their country ecosystems around the world. Uh, and that's not cheap, but they do it well. What we can do here is shake it up. Because we have data, and data trumps everything, we can change that power structure. So it's no longer who pharma is investing in or empowering or funding studies with around uh, whatever the patient group wants to study so that they can get a big grant from pharma. I'm not skeptical at all, right? Um, we can shake up that power structure. And we can work with those ecosystem partners to say, yeah, you're getting a grant here, but..." Let's see what the real world data says. Let's see what the outcomes data says. And you can shake it up. Which brings me to F, the future. And this is the last letter. We're not going through the whole alphabet. I promise. <laughs> F is future. You are the future. Pharma spends a lot of money to understand what the future looks like. That's the only way they survive 100 years. That's the only way you can plan for 10 years of development for one new drug. You need to do very good planning. So we work, Pharma works with every big consultant and analytics group out there. So if each one of you here today go home and put out a press release from your institution saying, we are committed to a learning healthcare system. Here's how we are going to be part of a learning healthcare system. Here's our five-year plan for a learning healthcare system. Well, guess what? Come January, 
every McKinsey, PwC, Deloitte, Accenture, E&Y consultant is going to be presenting that to pharma CEOs, saying, oh, there's this trend in the US you should be aware of. All of these groups have committed to a learning healthcare system. Here's what that means for your organization. Here's what that means for the people you need to hire. Here's what that means for your resource allocation. And so literally here today, you get to change the future of pharma. Because if you do that, if you make that commitment to a learning healthcare system, that's going to change their processes. That's going to change their companies. And that's going to change their ability to be a partner for us in a learning healthcare system. So I look forward to seeing what each of you do here today when you go home to influence and catalyze a change in the ABCs. And of course, I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you.